While culture affirms your right to believe what you want, it is increasingly uncomfortable with some beliefs that are considered unacceptable. And more and more, we hear Christians labeled as intolerant. And with us in studio today is Robbie Zacharias. Hello, Robbie. It's always good to be with you, Bob. It seems like here in the States, you can't pick up a newspaper without seeing someone accuse someone else of being intolerant. And interestingly, that charge is generally coming from secularists. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah, it's... Um... It's the buzzword. You know, I remember on the heels of the Cultural Revolution, uh, 60s and 70s, uh, when we were trying to coin new words for um, new behavior or uh, justifying certain types of behavior. All of a sudden, there were new there was new coinage for language. Things that were once described in one way were then described in another way. The vocabulary was changing. Terms like values, clarification, uh, both of which were undefined but uh, had an ideological bent and things like hate speech and, uh, you know, instead of uh, free speech, then you all of a sudden came out with hate speech. So tolerance really became the word for the new relativist base for your choices and anyone who posted an absolute into the discussion was considered intolerant. So it was the absolutization of a relativistic ethic, meaning anything goes so long as you're okay with it, relativize it to yourself and if you are, if, if in the open marketplace of ideas somebody questions you, then they're intolerant. That's the way it came about and many books were written on the subject. One has to be very careful. All kinds of dictionaries were developed as to what forms of intolerance were taking place. Even things like lookism, you know, you can't look at a person in a strange way when they say something. One of the campuses was dealing with that word. So not only can you not say anything, you can't even look in a, in a certain way. And if people in the East, we speak with our faces and with our hands, that's basically telling us to turn our backs to their conversation so we don't offend anybody. And put you in a straitjacket. <laughs> That's right, or a mask. Yeah, there you go. Uh, D.A. Carson recently wrote a book on this topic, and we're going to be talking about that book in this discussion today. And the book is called The Intolerance of Tolerance. And he said that when he goes to college campuses, he's often asked to speak on this topic. He points out that the definition has changed over the years, where tolerance used to mean, I believe what I want, you believe what you believe, and I respect your right to believe that, but I don't necessarily have to agree with it. Now you'll find dictionaries that will say, and let me quote it, acceptance of different views. Uh, that's a subtle change, but it means a lot, doesn't it? Yes, and of course, as he goes to show how the dictionaries themselves redefine this term, which tells you how um, uh, impossible it is to be neutral for some people, even though they want you to be neutral, they are already stacking the deck in their favor. But I think what is, I would go one step beyond uh, uh, even what Don Carson has gone. In the dictionary, while they go to acceptance, I think in, in society, they want you not just to accept, but to endorse and celebrate. So, you know, even acceptance can be nuanced, saying, well, you know, what do I do? I have to accept this reality. But they, are, they mean more than that. They mean to, to accept it as quite normative and not make value judgments on it. And the one step beyond that is not just to accept it and not make value judgments, but come out with a value judgment saying this is a good thing. So that, I think, is where we're headed. It's tough, Bob. You know, uh, I have to be so careful as a public speaker. Um, uh, I remember uh, speaking at a conference recently, and I had no intention of even nuancing the word. But I talked about how we go about life with gay abandon, you know, and that's, of course, an old phrase that you use. And I, after I said it, I said, oh, brother, somebody's going to think I'm talking about an alternate lifestyle sexually, so that's not the intention at all. But you have to be very careful how you even use words. And this is, uh, I like to put it this way. Everybody may have a right to what they believe, but that does not mean everything they believe is right. And in a, the free marketplace of ideas, we ought to be able to, with uh, willingness, entertain alternative views and not do that with being disagreeable at the same time. Well, Robbie, the, the ramifications for the Christian are severe. Uh, how in the world does the Christian present the gospel as truth in an environment where any claim to knowing the truth is seen as gross intolerance? It's a great question, Bob. And, you know, uh, the Bible says, can any Ethiopian change his skin and leopard its spots? 
I can't change my skin. I come from where I come from. I was born and raised in India. It's very fascinating. If you go to India or being raised in India, nobody stands up there and apologizes that there's a Hindu substructure to the culture, our culture in India. There are views that are taught from the class by professors. You expect him or her to say the things they do. And you don't sit there sort of saying, oh, I don't like what he's saying. I'm going to question him because I don't believe the same thing. But out in the West, that's really what's happened in reverse. The Judeo-Christian worldview framed how we came to be where we are today, the ethical belief system, the substructure of free speech, the intrinsic value of human life. Those are all really Christian ethics based on that. There's no other transcendent worldview that lends itself to these ramifications. But here we are now. We are uh, a worldview that made all these benefits of discussion possible is now evicted from the arena. The very universities that were founded by people who were uh, followers of Jesus Christ are now people who are not allowed to say the things that uh, they, they were once upon a time allowed to say. So when I go into a public arena and speak, my goodness, uh, you have to always walking on eggshells. You have to be very wise. Now, if people do go to another extreme and lash out, I think, unwisely and um, foolishly. It's not necessary. But in, in the marketplace of ideas and discussion and disagreement, if you're not allowed to say what you believe and why you believe, how are you ever going to put it to the test of truth? So that's the thing. Truth has now been neutered. And I remember in the 60s reading what Adlai Stevenson had once said. He said, what we need is a new word in the English dictionary. That word is yo. It neither means yes nor no. So that illusion of neutrality is what we think we are living under, and that is absolutely not so. It is neutral to the one who wants to foist his or her worldview. It's a one-edged sword. Lop off the opposition. Keep a blunt edge towards yourself. Uh, Berger's plausibility structure raises another problem for evangelicals and apologists as yourself. How do you change the culture if, uh, if you're seen as intolerant and as a result nothing that you say is seen as valuable? In reality, Bob, uh, these things have been battled in different ways before. How did a Wilberforce change the culture of the plausibility of slavery? You know, how did John Newton come out of something like that and battle against it? How did Martin Luther King uh, rail against the um, horrific practice of racial prejudice and so on? Uh, reformers will come on the scene. These these kinds of soils make it ready-made for, uh, for reformers. You know, uh, G.K. Chesterton made the comment that tolerance is really the creed of a person who doesn't believe anything. And in many ways, that's what is supposedly happening. Uh, the, so the first thing I think is somebody will emerge. I think the second thing is I still have confidence in our youth, even though they may be a minority. Just recently, I was speaking to an audience of 500 young people. Wonderful how they were engaging the ideas, nodding their heads and taking it on. I think these things will change one person at a time. And you, hey, that's the way when Christ came on, when Jesus came into the scene in, in the incarnation, his whole message was uh, not tolerated. How did he do it? One them one person at a time, and ultimately after the collapse of Rome and Christendom taking over the world, uh, the history of the world changed. But I think it's going to be a steep climb. And sadly, uh, Christians have said things that have helped push the this definition of intolerance, this new definition of tolerance, and, and we can unfortunately quote some some people who've said things like this. And uh, Carson, in his book, quotes a couple of well-known Christians and things that they've said publicly. And let me read them and, and have you respond to them. Uh, we won't name these people, but uh, but this has been said in public. One is, you say you're supposed to be nice to the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and the Methodists and this and that and the other thing. Nonsense. I don't have to be nice to the spirit of the Antichrist. I can love the people who have false opinions, but I don't have to be nice to them. And then another comment from another person that we'll leave unnamed was, I want hatred to wash over you. Yes, hate is good. Our goal is a Christian nation. We have a biblical duty. We're called by God to conquer this country. We don't want equal time. We don't want pluralism. 
These comments make us cringe, but I guess as Christians we are supposed to hate evil, aren't we? And I think we as Christians who are defending the truth and the faith ought to speak out against this kind of thing as well. You know, the old adage which I've quoted quite often, my mother used to say, once you've cut off a person's nose, don't give them a rose to smell. What is the object of the Christian faith? Is it to devastate the person or to win the person? That's the question. If you are there to just lash out and flay them, and some apologists historically have done that. No, I think the ultimate ethic and the greatest ethic is love. Who, while we were yet sinners, sent his son? who loves us in spite of the fact that we are unlovable. It is fascinating to me how the Lord handled two of the most broken lives in the New Testament. The woman of Samaria, how he gently peeled the layer away. And it is fascinating what she says, come and see the one who knew everything about me. And what is unsaid there is, and he didn't cut me down at the knees. What she says is, Messiah has probably come. Come and see that one. And then the woman who comes with the alabaster ointment. Interesting. I think if uh, if a legalist were there, he'd have just said, where do you get this from? Well, what kind of money did you use for this? She has never even said that. He paid her the greatest compliment in the scriptures, that wherever the gospel of his message was going to be told, so was also what this woman had done in her act of worship. And and by loving somebody and uh, giving them the opportunity to sense that love, you actually conquer, not only in the ends, you also conquer with the right means. Almost every Muslim that I know has come to Christ has come either through visions or dreams or because they've seen the love of Jesus. This kind of vitriolic language is nothing more than pride masquerading as righteousness.